Let me first say that it is an honor to, from this platform, be able to praise all of the musicians who every week give me so much pleasure. If we could give them a round of applause. When uh, Scott Colglazier told me that he was going on sabbatical and asked me to deliver a sermon in his absence, I said, only if I don't have to speak from the pulpit or march up in the processional or wear a robe. He said, okay, if you'll promise me that you won't use the F word. I guess a deal is a deal. <laughs> so I will try to restrain my bad self. Now, full disclosure, I am not a member of this church, nor do I call myself a Christian. And yet, most Sundays at this hour, here I am. Why? I suppose it goes back to a Sunday morning in New York in June of 1987. I was a struggling stand-up comic, a lifelong asthmatic who awoke in my new girlfriend's apartment to the worst attack of my life. I was breathing at 11% capacity by the time the ambulance got me to the ER, and as the crisis subsided, I was wheeled up to a room where I stayed for the next six days. I was released the next Saturday on a steamy, hazy summer afternoon in New York, and on the sidewalk, I, I was enveloped by an epiphany a tsunami sudden spiritual flash flood, a status quo capsizing, soul supersizing event. I was Damascus bound Saul, my scaly eyes tipped by Yahweh's big thumb. I, who'd been indifferent to God, was now awestruck by His presence. And if I could describe it, it's like when I heard for the first time live one of my favorite pieces of music, the theme from Once Upon a Time in the West by Ennio Morricone, performed by I Chin and Christoph and Benedict. Anybody who is here knows that was undeniably beautiful in a way that you cannot put into words nor communicate to others who do not hear it. Um, I, who dismissed Jesus, now upgraded him to possible Messiah. <laughs> and this moment became the BCAD of my life. I was now one step inside of a circle I had always lived one step outside of. Just two steps, but still a world of difference. And during this time, all fears and regrets listed in the debt column of my life's ledger, were canceled by the offsetting blessings of this undeserved, unpetitioned for bliss. Let me describe um, what I felt like during this hyper-appreciative state with a story that's told about Preston Sturgis while directing his 1947 comedy, Unfaithfully Yours. His Leading lady, Linda Darnell, wasn't hitting the right note in a scene, so Sturgis walks over to her, and then very quietly he says, close your eyes, and imagine that you are 90 years old, and you are on your deathbed, and just before you die, God lets you return to your current health and beauty for one moment. Can you imagine how grateful you would feel? And then Darnell whispered, yes. And then Sturgis set, stepped back and said, okay, now open your eyes and action. 
Such was my post-hospital gratitude, which I thought was going to last the rest of my lifetime, but by week's end, my caffeinated consciousness had evaporated. And in my post-bliss hangover, my fears and my regrets were reappearing, and I was the same old sleepwalking me, only abashed because briefly I had been Buddha awake, and I absorbed the sad fact that perhaps my positively Pentecostal high owed less to the deity than to drugs in my blood system or mental illness in my bloodline. I had had both. I, I still believed in God, but I felt completely disconnected from Him. And so to try to kickstart myself toward cosmic consciousness and renew my expired grace state, I made three pledges to the universe. The first was, if anybody wanted to talk to me about God, I would have to listen. Second, if anybody wanted me to read any spiritual literature, I would have to read it. Third, if anybody wanted me to go to any kind of service, I would have to go. I didn't have to accept what I heard, saw, or read. I just had to be considerate of what was offered to me. So, for the next few months, if I was walking down um, a street on the Upper West Side where I lived in Manhattan and there was some guy, some street corner preacher haranguing passers-by, I couldn't keep walking. I would have to stop and I would have to listen until I felt that I had fully heard his message before I could continue my life. Um, or if I was on the subway and someone was passing out pamphlets predicting the end of the world, I would have to take the flyer and read it and I would note the date on my calendar. Um, and for several months at one o'clock on Wednesday afternoons, I welcomed a Jehovah's Witness named Kim into my apartment and I, I, he would sit on my sofa, I would get him a glass of water and he would talk to me for an hour and at the end I would say, Kim, once again, I accept nothing that you believe, and I'll see you next week. <laughs> After a year of seeking the kingdom of the Lord, some good things were being added unto me. My health had improved. I got engaged. We bought my apartment. We hoped to start a family. I got my first TV writing gig on a show with a three-year commitment. And one night on PBS, I saw a Bill Moyers program about Thomas Jefferson's Bible and thought, well, here's an idea that could be easily and quickly developed into a play. So once again, I was back in the mode of thought where I predicted that my life was going to be a constant cavalcade of blessings, but the TV job that I got was a nightmare. It was a clinic in how not to produce a show. And then just 10 weeks after being on the air, it was canceled at Christmas. And so I returned to the life of a struggling comic from which I had hoped I'd been magically matriculated. And maybe there was a play in the Jefferson idea, but I sure had not found it yet. So. I suffered a second hangover, which, like the movie series of the same name, was worse than the original. <laughs> and in my ingratitude, I became a thesaurus of unattractive adjectives. Didn't I deserve blessings? Hadn't I been mindful of? No, wait, I hadn't been mindful of anything. I'd been too busy to pray. My nightstand was stacked with unread books I'd been given. I was too tired to attend any ceremonies. I'd fudged on my diet and I'd skipped exercise and I'd been absent from my apartment for so many Wednesdays in a row that my Jehovah's Witness had stopped knocking at my door. 
I had been serving no god but mammon, and I'd confused blessings with entitlements and ceased to deserve either. My next thought was, maybe my career and soul run on two separate tracks. Maybe effort in one lane does not accrue rewards in the other. And since then, I've tried to balance career and live within God-connected gratitude. So, I would like to share with you five ideas that have served me. You may find them helpful. I know that I would now be a better man than I am if I followed these precepts better than I do. Number one, you can't make yourself successful, but you can make yourself busy. Uh, the only sport I follow is baseball because, like life, it's played every day. Yesterday's runs, like yesterday's prayers, don't count today. So, ball players just grind it out, one game, one at bat, one pitch at a time. So, go thou and play likewise. Number two, make a commonplace book. Jefferson kept a blank journal in which he copied quotes from books he read, and I think that quotes written down and checked out can cut like diamonds through life's confusion. And after a while, these collected comments of yours can comprise a de facto map of your heart. Here are two of my compass points. The first example for my commonplace book is, I love this line, Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Matthew 2.26 was the very first verse that I ever heard where I began to think that I might have underestimated Jesus. He says, people are not created as slaves of rules, but rather rules are presented to serve people. How rad is that? And the other quote that I would like to share is uh, today's scripture, which I so appreciated Petra reading, Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. Now, to tell the story, Jesus really only needed two people, two servants, uh, one who worked with what he was given and one who did not. But by using three examples, Jesus makes a second point. The two workers who proved themselves to be good and faithful servants received different sized gifts from their master. The first got five talents, and the second got two. Yet by working with what they were given, both pleased their master. So none of us can control how many or what the nature is of the talents that we get. I have well become aware that I am not the genius who got five. Uh, but I must work with the two or maybe even the one that I got, not bemoan the full handful given to Mozart or Shakespeare or Picasso or Orson Welles or Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Secondly, if not a um, commonplace book of words, then perhaps one of songs. Um, I was raised on rock and roll and I was always embarrassed by songs about God, particularly on albums by artists I liked uh, that I had paid money for. I loved to sing along with songs, and I couldn't sing along with songs whose lyrics I did not believe, so God songs became the buzzkills on my vinyl collection. <laughs> but in this AD era of mine, I'm in a mixtape of all of those uncool cuts, and I walk-manned down Manhattan, giving each song a shot to become a keeper on my playlist, which is now on my iPod and from which are chosen some of today's songs. Third, embed gratitude to others. The sweet and of my day is nightly prayers 
with my 15-year-old daughter, I will go into her room and I'll hold her hand and I will recite the Lord's Prayer. I use trespasses, sorry, debts users. And I end with, dear God, please bless your very special servant, Colette T. Carter, who is grateful tonight because. And then there's a pause. And then her beautiful, quiet voice names something from her day, time spent with her friend Grace, or dissecting a frog in biology, or that the Pokemon Go app finally came out. And as she expresses gratitude, I become grateful. Four, treat everyone you meet with respect. Don't expect gratitude, but appreciate it if it comes. A while back, I got an email from a producer who'd worked with me seven years before on a show that lasted just two seasons. And now he was running shows of his own and he sent a photo of his young son with a note saying that when we worked together, his wife, and now I'm gonna quote from his email, accidentally got pregnant and she said, we should probably terminate. I told her, honey, I'm on a show that's going to go on for years. We can afford another kid. Let's do it. Thus, the unbelievably happy result is my son, James, the human being that exists because of you. So, thank you. And finally, attend gatherings that humbly address the mystery of life. I know some people who go to 12-step meetings. I know some people who go to group therapy. I know some people who join book clubs. But on Sundays, I come to this church. I come to be surprised and delighted by beauty. I come for sights, for silence, for sounds, for words. I come early, I always come down that aisle, and I often go into the darkened pew over there so that I can sneak in a second meditation to open up my heart and mind. And at 11 o'clock, when the bell rings, I then congregate with this coalition of searchers who perhaps like me seek a missing piece in a personal puzzle. The service, as it progresses, kind of floats by me and I confess that my focus will tune in and out, not from boredom, but because when I'm here, Thoughts surface in my mind, and so I sit, uh, during the service, I sit pen in hand with my program, and I'm like a telegraph operator in an Old West train station waiting for a Morse-coded message to click in. And, and then when it does, I will scribble a note in my program, and then I will focus back. Sometimes as I listen, a grudge from the weak bubbles up in my brain. And then, on further review, the resentment recedes and gradually gratitude returns. As I forgive those whom I believe have trespassed against me, I feel my own trespasses being forgiven. And often while I'm here in those moments, in my eye will appear a sanctifying teardrop. I come for the cast of this weekly pageant. I come for Scott and Laura and Tom and Christoph and Jonathan and Stephen and the rock star choir. 
I come for the first kids, first kids, bouncing up the steps. I come for the morning coated ushers, passing brass, double-handed velvet pouches into which soon may you all be generous. I come to pass the peace in which for me I find the peace that passes all understanding. I come for the end of the recessional when the choir that has gone down the middle aisle then wraps around the congregation and at the end of the song I feel like I'm in a living room with the world's greatest sound system. I come post-service to the chancel for communion. And there I raise my open palms to remind my by that time hungry self that each morsel received should be savored as sacred. And when I leave post-fellowship with the knots in my mind a little loosened, my heart a little less clenched, and my spirit ready for the coming week in which I will try to remember to act in gratitude and trust that in life highs will come, my wedding day, the gift of two beautiful baby girls, the success of my Jefferson play after 27 years and my nearly three decades in TV. But in the meantime, sufficient unto the day is the joy thereof. Close your eyes. Now imagine that you are on your deathbed. And just before you die, God lets you return to the most absolutely glorious edition of yourself. Imagine how grateful you would feel. Now open your eyes and action.